slide advancer and laser pointer in the middle. Ooh, lasery. All right. Um, so let's get started. First of all, um, I would like to thank you all for coming out. Um, particularly if you are as hungover as I am, it is 10 in the morning on the third day of a conference. Gree party yesterday was pretty good, so um, thank you for coming here. Um, that voice you hear in your head is not psychosis, it's actually me talking, so that's good. Um, welcome to day three of Casual Connect here in Hamburg. We've got a great lineup for you here in Hall 1 today. We're going to be talking all about kind of online casual games, mostly is manifested on social networks. We're going to have some conversations about browser games, about MMOs. Um, I think it's going to be a rich, rewarding day. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of roll the program here. Um, my name's Dave Rural. I'm going to be your MC today. Um, so I will, I will be up here to annoy you every half hour or so throughout the day. Um, I'm currently working as a creative director at Playdom. Um, I have been in the game industry now for about 18 years as a producer, designer, and studio leader. Um, I was making browser games before browser games are cool. First person who says browser games still aren't cool gets punched in the mouth, so if anybody wants to stop that. Um, there you go. So started in edutainment, made web games at Pogo, ran the downloadable business, started a studio for PopCap, um, and for the last four years been working in social games, first at Zynga and now at Playdom. Um, so my presentation today, to, to, oh, before I get started, um, please set your cell phones to vibrate or turn them off or make them not ring in the middle of stuff because it's not good when they do that. Boo. Um, so my presentation today, this is a new one for me, is titled the Social Gaming Crystal Ball 2012 Edition. Um, so, you know, some of you might be wondering, wh what exactly do I mean by the Social Gaming Crystal Ball here? Um, so those of you who kind of go around to various GDC and Casual Connect iterations have probably seen me on stage before. Um, my colleague Steve Moretzky and I do a little road show with a presentation called The Year in Social Games, where we look backwards over the previous year, try and pick out the most interesting trends, look at what happened in the marketplace. This is not that presentation. That presentation is actually a very efficient rear view mirror, where we really take a moment to take stock and look backward at what the previous year brought us. What I'm hoping to do today is to give you a nice, full, open view through the windshield. The rear view mirror is still in the picture, but rather than taking a look at what happened, I want to get you to think about what's going to happen, and not only what's going to, to be out there, but why is it happening, what makes it come out at this unique moment in the brief history of social gaming, and what does it mean for you and your business? So. You might ask, what's the methodology that you use to uh, sort of predict the future here? So I kind of lick my finger, and I stick it up in the wind and see which way it's blowing, and then I kind of uh, record that in a journal. But seriously, um, I start with a lot of the analysis that I do for year in social gaming. What are the most interesting things that happened over the last year? And then I try and look for trend lines that have been going on for a couple of years that are starting to inflect right, that are starting to approach a vertical asymptote in terms of weight in the marketplace. Um, I take a look at general industry trend lines, so try to look a little bit beyond social games. We're very myopic for that presentation. I take a look at kind of what's happening in consumer internet and, you know, uh, mobile a little bit more, um, and then also look for interesting indications from fundings, acquisitions, um, industry luminary quotes, and so on. Um, so, Caveat auditor, which, you know, is Latin for uh, listener beware, or if you were not taking this course for credit, you should leave the lecture hall. Um, this is pretty speculative stuff. The future is kind of hard to predict. Um, I'm frequently wrong even when assessing the past, so take it all with a, a pillar of salt. But, you know, this is kind of one market observer's view of what we're going to be looking at in the coming year. So, without further ado, Sorry, I had some ado. Uh, the first trend that I'd like to talk about is social gaming going casual, or initially the slide said traditional casual. So really seeing a, a strong surge of the kinds of play patterns that we've seen in casual downloads over the last mm, decade or so. Um, so kind of looking at the trend line here, if you thought about Facebook gaming in 2008 or 2009, you thought about text RPGs like Mafia Wars or Sorority Life, Castle Age, 
really fundamentally the same games with some changes around the margin played out like a spreadsheet in a series of clicks through an HTML page. You could definitely see kind of simple decorators in 2009, 2010 becoming a, a dominant life form. So these were games without a whole lot of mechanic where you were running a, a very sort of simple economic flywheel in order to be able to decorate a, a decorator space. But there wasn't really a whole lot limiting you, right? You kind of had some, some money, very, very little limitations, very little game. So that was games like um, Baking Life, Hotel City, Farmville were really just all about making money to run a sticker book. In 2010 to 2011, we got a lot of a category of game that we refer to at Playdom as builders. So these kind of took that decoration space as end game and put a lot more mechanic on top of it with energy, resource economies, collectibles, and so on. So games like Cityville or Ravenwood Fair. And then if you kind of look at the storyline in 2011 into 2012, what you really start to see is a much more healthy diversity on the platform. So you start to see games like Social Empires, hardcore strategy games that are kind of all for the boys to fight the boys, right? Um, you see life management, right? Like people simulation, like Sim Social, kind of starting to emerge as a genre, people trying to take a swing at that. You see the builder perfected and extended with storylines and great characters, super high production values like Castleville. Um, and you also see a, a resurgence of the RPG leveling, gearing up avatar mechanics in games like Crime City, right, where they've gone isometric. So, you know, clearly this is, you know, biodiversity. We're in the days of the early mammals. So when you get this kind of thing out there, you wonder who's going to dominate. My key hypothesis is it's going to look a lot like casual downloads. They're going to become very, very important in the next year. So we started to see this already. Um, if you look in 2010, kind of the, the hits that we had that were in that category were pretty slim, right? You had Bejeweled Blitz continuing on a real strong run, started in 2009. Um, and you had Bubble Island from, uh, from Wooga, which, you know, uses a kind of snood little bubble shooting mechanic. If you look at 2011, those games both continued strong. They're both meaningful presences in the top 50, but you started to see much more rapid additions. Things like Gardens of Time from Playdom, bringing the hidden object genre to Facebook in a big way. Um, you get Bingo Blitz making a very strong run and kind of establishing that category. You get Words with Friends turning into a top 10 game and many others, things like, you know, slot machines, other casino sims, but, you know, really, this stuff's been pushing up. So, why is this actually working? Why do Facebook gamers want to do this? Well, first of all, the psychographics and the demographics of Facebook gamers look a lot like the folks who bought casual downloadables, right? Our payers at Playdom are dominated by adult women. Um, sorry, and also there's a well understood core game to deliver that core basic fun. You're not really wondering, you know, can a bingo game be fun? Headline, a bingo game can be fun. Um, so, why is this happening now? Um, Clearly, the downloadable category has been kind of crumbling for the last couple of years, and the rocks are starting to fall off the cliff pretty fast at this point. And that puts a lot of development talent in the market that knows how to build this kind of game, right? Knows how to deliver that kind of fun for this market. Um, the code has been cracked multiple times on how you bring this sort of thing to Facebook. So if you go back and look at Facebook games in 2007, 2008, you had a lot of uh, downloadable makers just trying to put high score based versions, uh, high score based flash versions of their game on Facebook and getting no traction. Now you look at Gardens of Time, that's one formula for executing this, Bejeweled Blitz is another and so on. They're really well understood ways of packaging that casual, casual gameplay. And, you know, I have to say after the kind of success that Bejeweled and Gardens of Time have had, this market is pretty proven. People aren't wondering if this is going to get swallowed. Um, so again, returning, these were some of our big casual game hits in 2011, but one of the really fascinating things to me as I started to think about the category is there's a bunch of stuff missing, right, that isn't out there, and there's no, no reason that these things shouldn't work. Time management is the second most popular category in downloadable games, and really doesn't meaningfully exist on the Facebook platform. Um, I'm pretty much guaranteeing that by the end of 2012, it will in some meaningful form. Mahjong was a huge genre in the early history of downloadables. There are a couple of things with some decent traction but no dominant life form. Zuma, PopCap's taken a run at the bubble popper. This has sold millions and millions and millions. I, I think they're kind of done with it, but I think someone else may find this one. 
Um, Again, we've looked at life sim like The Sims, but you know, virtual villagers, plant tycoon, that kind of big simulation actually was critically important for downloadable category a few years ago. Wouldn't be surprised to see it show up. And hell, why not the most popular computer game of all time? But um, just like every aspect of social gaming, there's no easy money here, right? There's gonna be a lot of bodies on the side of the road. Um, putting together Social gameplay, persistence, long drive, and casual gameplay is hard. Execution is key. Um, it's pretty easy to do this badly, um, and the market doesn't swallow that, and there are lots of people trying. Um, so, you know, do think about these holes in the marketplace. They're a great opportunity for you and your business. If you're trying to figure out what can I ride the charts with next year, uh, I do think looking at some of those gaps is a fair idea. Um, you really want to stock up on both sides of the skill coin here, both people who really understand social games, free to play, virtual goods, how to drive re-engagement, as well as people who really, really understand how to make a time management game or a, a Mahjong game or a virtual villagers fun. Um, the winners here are gonna win very big, but the winners here are gonna be executing very, very well. Bold prediction number two. Two, two, two. Um, HTML5 games start to make a dent, um, but in 2012 at least, they don't become the dominant life form. So, um, everybody know what HTML5 is? Raise your hand if you know what HTML5 is. Okay, so real quickly, um, HTML5, new standard for web development, open source, not owned by anybody like Flash, um, has some really nice support for kind of 2D sprite animations through a tool called the Canvas. Um, not a super high performance tool, but kind of gets you there. Um, gives you 3D gaming support via WebGL, which is still very, very young, and has the virtue of being able to run on any device. So, unlike, say, you know, Adobe Flash, if you have something like this in your pocket, you know, not so happy. <laughs> um, so, we're still very, very early with these games, right? In late 2010, this was kind of the one HTML game on Flashbook. It was uh, one HTML5 game on Facebook. Um, it was a very simple tower defense game, not very well constructed for the platform. Um, in late 2011, like December, um, we got what we referred to internally as the first HTML5 game on Facebook that doesn't suck. Um, so this is a game called Skyscraper City. It's a nice little builder, has you constructing a city. But there's very little out there. It's still very early. We're not kind of seeing top of the market games yet. But I think there's a lot of indication that we're going to see this stuff happening. You know, HTML5 started to be a thing in early 2000 when Steve Jobs kind of made his first big argument against Flash and said, the future's going to be ruled by open web standards, right, in terms of, of game development. Um, big players started to take notice. Late 2010, Zynga purchased a German company, uh, Dextrose AG, for their HTML5 engine, started doing some HTML5 experimentation. Um, Early 2011, Facebook announced that they felt the future was HTML5, started doing browser benchmarks specifically for games. Um, early 2011, Disney actually purchased a company called Rocket Pack that makes an HTML5 development kit. So clearly the big players are coming in. Um, you know, big players in the marketplace are saying, we want this. The big players who are trying to supply in that marketplace are investing in the tech. Um, and in November 2011, Adobe just said, we give up, Flash for mobile's a dead end. Uh, we support HTML5, right? So. This is a pretty clear trail of indicators. So then, uh, you know, uh, what's this all about? Why is this important? Why should you care on Facebook games? Flash works perfectly well. Well, um, the web is big money today, for sure, but the growth in the mobile market is ridiculous, right? Facebook continues to grow, but not at this kind of pace. So you can kind of see very quickly what's happening even between, you know, 2010 and 2011, even though the, the mobile market is fairly large, you're still seeing something like 33% growth in it. Um, and that trend line is going to continue. Um, in a bold forecast, I didn't put on a slide, I, I, I do believe that by 2015, the desktop consumer web is going to be more or less deprecated, right? You're going to be taking in the internet entirely on phones and tablets. Um, so is this always a good idea, um, you know, to kind of get your stuff out there cross-platform like HTML5 allows you? Um, kinda, sorta. It's not free. If you just port your web app straight up, you're going to make a pretty bad experience on the phone and vice versa, form factors are different. Um, your finger turns out to be bigger proportional to your phone than it does to your monitor, who knew? Um, there are different play patterns, phone sessions are very short. Um, 
You've got different release cycles on the web you're releasing continuously. If you're on iOS, you're releasing every couple of weeks, much more curated. So, you know, you actually do have to put in some effort, but a partial free port is better than no free port. So, why, given all these virtues, all this pressure to get on mobile, to be cross-platform, all this tech pressure, do I not think HTML5 will be dominant this year? It's, it's a little bit early. Um, there's a lot of skilled Flash teams out there. There's a lot of games in the pipeline. Um, at Playdom, you know, we're really finding that our, our product cycles are now kind of in that nine to 12 month zone. It really takes a while to get something through the pipeline and get it market ready. Um, browser performance is highly variable depending on which set of uh, benchmarks you use. You can see anything from a uh, 3x variation in game performance from popular browsers to something more like, you know, hmm, 10x, right, from Opera, or even if you look at, at uh, Safari here, kind of 6x. So you don't quite know what you're getting in the same consistent way you do with Flash. So um, what does this mean to you and your business in social gaming? If you're not gearing up for HTML5 development, you probably should be. Um, I certainly would if I were you. Um, you need a mobile strategy. The desktop web is going away. Whether my call of 2015 is accurate or not, um, the web is going in your pocket. You want to be ready for that. If you don't have a mobile strategy, get one. Um, watch out for browser performance variants. You're going to have to really design to some tech constraints here. Um, and just a heads up, I think that this section is going to look very, very different in 2013. Um, prediction number three. IP becomes very important. Not that working at Disney, I have any you know, vested interest here, um, but it's not a magic wand. So why is IP important? Facebook, by my best estimation, they're not publishing a number at the moment, seems to have about 3 million apps. iOS has about 600,000. Um, that turns out to be a lot, right? And when you have a lot of stuff in one haystack, the needle is kind of hard to find. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a good game, it's really all about getting users to kind of find your game. So let's think for a moment about where little users come from on Facebook. Well, sometimes when a, a company and a game love each other very much, they kind of get together in a special way and little you know. Um, Facebook's tried a bunch of stuff for game discovery. So they really started with directory search, right? The app directory is supposed to be the first great way to find content on Facebook. Pretty much a fail, right? You got very little traffic out of it. It wasn't well organized. Um, they've tried the game channel, right? A kind of dedicated page that people would go to for data about games. Um, we never really saw any traction from that. Um, clearly, very early in Facebook, the way that you acquired users, you got them for free through virals, right? Um, but even though it's having a little bit of a resurgence, the virality of the platform has been generally pared back over the last few years. So we can kind of eliminate that as a top cause. Now, of course, you're always going to have word of mouth. The best way that people discover any kind of consumer good is by recommendations from their friends. And that's very meaningful. And virals have a little bit of that character. But really, these days, it's an advertising arbitrage game, right? You are buying your users through Facebook advertising. And you're trying to buy them for less than their lifetime value. Because if you buy them for more than their lifetime value, not such a good business. So. The way that your product looks in a very compact ad is very important. And of course, you know, since you're trying to, to arbitrage, you're trying to buy for less than LTV, it is to your advantage to lower your advertising costs. So we've often wondered at Playdom, can the use of IP lower your advertising costs? We said, if only we had some sort of intellectual property or brand we could associate with some of our games. How we wish we could do this kind of experiment. Oh, wait, uh, we do. And our finding is, yes, actually, you can get a very significant decrease in cost by uh, cost of acquisition by using a well-known brand that resonates with the target audience. And if that brand is consistent with the game, that traffic will stick and do quite well for you. Oh, and we're also not the only folks to discover this, right? So, you know, here's some top apps from the App Store and from Facebook, from uh, EA who are heavily leveraging their brands with a lot of success. These are all sort of top 25 apps on their platforms. Um, some additional benefits. You get a built-in fan base. You have people who are looking for this content. You have um, potentially the ability to drive premium price points. Some of the EA games I showed on the previous slide, you know, that were on the App Store launched at $9.99 and had significant traction there. That's very, very hard to do. 
um, you can get a free content stream, right? You know, if you got the NFL license, guess what? You get F NFL player data. If you got ESPN, you've got a lot of stuff coming through the pipe. Marvel, turns out they've done a fair amount of Marvel content. But as you look at licensed games on the platform, you see a lot of these classic Facebook shark fins, right? These are games that did not raise very high and fell precipitously, right? So you have Monopoly topping out at 900,000 users, looks like about six weeks after launch and tumbling down. Same kind of pattern for ESPNU College Town, Dragon Age Legends never even gets off the ground, right? Madden has a little bit more of a steady decline, but really no volume. So just having an IP isn't gonna do it for you. Um, that's because IPs in general, um, in open box categories especially, are really good at driving trial, but not at driving conversion. And often when we think about conversion in a free-to-play game, we think about conversion to payer, but really in many ways the most critical reten or the most critical conversion that we need to focus on is kind of seven to 14 day retention. People who become long-term players of your game have a high propensity to pay and vice versa, right? So you need a good game to have people sticking around, not just a brand and ingenious monetization design. And prediction number four, and this is the last one I'm gonna go into in depth so that I don't bog down the proceedings unduly. Um, only duly. Mobile to web begins to get leverage. So I think this is the year where we start to see this, but again, doesn't really become dominant, just starts to put a chink in the armor. Um, so a lot of folks have had success, or yeah, a lot of folks have had success kind of taking established play patterns and brands from uh, Facebook to mobile. In particular, iOS is you know, the, the area in which I'm most knowledgeable, so that's where I gathered the stats. So here are a couple of Zynga games that really, you know, have perpetual runs kind of in the top 50 apps, right, in the, um, in the market. You look at Zynga Poker, that's actually been a steady fixture in the top 10 for a long time. So you can bring stuff directly. Um, and frankly, you can kind of <coughs> derive deep inspiration uh, from successful stuff on Facebook and have some success with it on, face on, uh, on mobile. Um, City Story uh, owes a fair bit to Social City. Um, Bakery Story owes a fair bit to uh, Cafe World. Um, again, both perpetual top 50s. Um, now, I looked around for stories of mobile IPs coming to Facebook in 2010, and this was the only one I found, which was kind of a crash and burn. Um, but then I started looking in 2011 and you start to see some real traction on things like Words with Friends, on Smurfs Village, stuff that's done well on iOS that really has some traction on Facebook. Um, what are we gonna see in 2012? I think there is big money to be had on Facebook, even if the growth isn't there, but that's a great place to, expand, to extend prize IPs from mobile. So I, I predict these things that are kind of getting uh, inspiration derived from them on the mobile side are going to take to the web and see how far they can get. Things like Tiny Tower, Tap Zoo, Dragon Veil. Um, I think it would be really interesting to see how they fare on Facebook and I think their developers will think the same. Why? There are a lot of similar play patterns, right? We're looking at the same kind of time re-engagement, customization, the same drivers of retention and gameplay. Um, there is related expertise, really. This is about games as a service. This is about managing in a virtual goods world, right, in, in both platforms. Um, and uh, mobile companies are now getting enough traction in their business to have enough resources to come and make some aggressive plays on the web. But, as I mentioned before in the HTML5 section, it's not a freebie. There are di critical differences in play pattern. There are big differences in UI. Um, interoperation is very, very hard. When you're deploying daily on a web game and you're deploying you know, a couple of times a month on a mobile game, keeping your back end friendly to both those deployment cycles is a very difficult operational challenge. Um, and we're gonna see, I think, a lot of competition, right, in these areas, trying to bring these play patterns onto the web. Um, so just like at the end of the Gilligan's Island theme, I really kind of ran out of time before I could cover all the trends I wanted to, so here are some of the ones that got cut, um, if you wanna ask about those, but the all singing, all dancing, photorealistic 3D game still doesn't make it. That's really not gonna be a thing on Facebook, um, maybe ever, but certainly not this year. It's not where the market sits. Um, 2009, we'll come back for hardcore strategy games. In 2009, we had two ridiculously monetizing hardcore strategy games sitting at a million DAU. Um, I think that market's really fragmented and is gonna get worse. There's a lot of people coming in. Um, and 
2011 was a kind of bumpy year for Zynga quality, some great stuff, some not so great stuff. I'm kind of wondering what 2012 is going to look like now that they have some public market pressure on them to deliver quarter to quarter. Um, so that's kind of what I see coming up in 2012. I want to thank you for coming out this early in the morning. I want to curse myself for signing up this early in the morning. Um, happy to take your questions. This is the first time I've given uh, this particular type of lecture, so I would love your feedback as well. And if you have any uh, follow-ups you want to send me, I'm drural at platum.com. So thank you all for coming. Uh, peace out. Clap loud if you want an encore. Woo. All right. Um, so Lorette here is going to uh, run the microphone around if there are questions. Let's see how we're doing on time. All right. So we have time for some questions. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, you guys aren't a timid bunch. Let's... Uh, See what you got. Come on. I have a question. Yes, David. Why does an IP lower your acquisition cost when cost is typically cost per click? Um, IP kind of cuts through the clutter very efficiently, right? So people who are Disney fans, if they see a Disney logo in an ad, have a high propensity to click on it. They know it's a good that they want already. They actually don't even have to interpret the ad. So what you're doing is not necessarily increasing the propensity of the non-fan to click, but you're getting very, very high click density from that fan base, right? So, and it's actually on Facebook a, 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 a CPM business, right? You're, yeah. Not for yeah. me, it's not. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we run, you know, very high volumes of display just trying to, to drive clicks anywhere. But for us, we find, you know, Essentially, yeah, you you pull a lot through, right? Got the it. more so the more clicks you're getting, the lower your costs are. You guys, you guys operate on a CPM basis on Facebook, which right. is why it so that the, so it drives more clicks for the same number of impressions. Yeah, 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 got it. Okay. Any other questions for Dave? There's one back there. I'll take comments too. Come on. Hi, Dave. Hey, how's Morning. it going? Um, Talking about IPs, we, I'm, I'm a kind of a gamer, no hardcore gamer, when mm -hmm. I'm not uh, building casual games. Mm -hmm. And we, all, all the gamers that uh, play uh, PS3 and Xbox know this, that uh, when an IP game is coming out, uh -huh. it's usually you know, scheduled uh, for the time of the movie or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of uh, grannies bite for their uh, grandchildren, but right. it's not really fun to play. Now, in the, in the... Okay. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Lord of the Rings games were pretty good. I was at EA back then. Uh, right? they, they got they, six, seven. What's that? They, how, how much they got in uh, Metacritic? Uh, six, oh, seven. No. Oh, at any rate, that's okay. Anyway. So, but yeah, there, there are a lot of bad licensed games out yeah. there. So. And uh, when we talk about the social game, a lot of the revenues come from people keep uh, playing the, those games. So, right. wouldn't an IP game be a bad bet? Well... It depends. So, uh, again, just to recap the question, um, certainly in packaged goods, you get a lot of really bad licensed games, right? So, and there are reasons for that. Um, some of it is the schedule that you talked about. Often you're trying to synchronize with a movie launch or the beginning of a sports season. Um, some of it is the economics. Often you're paying a lot of money to the licensor, right? So for your economics to work, um, you have to be kind of stingy with development. Um, so, um, as I said, uh, one of the reasons, by the way, that licenses work really, really well in closed box businesses is that people will buy the box just for the license. This is especially true in, like, uh, kids' software, right? Um, here, you know you don't have that luxury, right? An IP will not save a bad game. And that's part of what that slide was about with Monopoly Millionaires and you know, Madden NFL and ESPNU. Those games were not good enough to sustain an audience. So the only thing I think an IP is really, really good for is bringing in that fan base, bring them in fast and bring them in cheap. But if you're not delivering to their expectations, it's a waste, regardless. Um, and you know, that's one of the reasons that, you know, for instance, the, the Marvel game um, from Playdom, which has been announced, is coming out now. It's not synchronized with a big movie release because we wanted it to be really ready for the market. So, is that right, thank you. Yep. More questions? We can play the laser pointer game, like if I dot you, you have to ask something. 
Look out. Hello. Uh, you said you expect the uh, games to vary in the next year, and you said casual will probably be the biggest part of it, but maybe you can tell what you beneath casual expect to come? What, which what? Uh, type of games uh, besides casual will come? Well, you know, there are a lot of players that are kind of entering and playing in the hardcore market, um, particularly the strategy market, pretty aggressively. I expect that that category as a whole will continue to grow, but I expect it to be very, very fragmented. Right? I'm not sure we're going to have super huge winners in that kind of backyard monsters, social empires, kingdoms of Camelot category. Um, so I expect that to be big. We're clearly going to continue to see builders. Builders sit at the top of the market with games like Cityville and Castleville, and people are going to continue to go after that in you know, kind of all the varieties, the, the kind of Frontierville game template. Um, for me, I, I picked out casual because I think that's the piece of the market that's going to most meaningfully inflect. Right? Right now, you look at the top 25 games, there's probably three games with casual, classic casual, you know, sort of puzzle or arcade gameplay. I would be really unsurprised if next year that were, you know, 10, 12. Uh, I see a big, a big footprint coming. And in fact, I think we're going to learn a lot in the next few months from looking at how Hidden Chronicles and um, uh, Gardens of Time coexist in the market, right? In casual download, um, those games are very consumable, and we see hidden object fans taking one game after another after another. In a universe where your favorite hidden object game is releasing new puzzles every week, will people actually play multiple? You know, I, I don't know. We'll find out. All right, I think um, if there's one more question, I'm happy to take it, but I don't want to get the program too delayed. I know it's the, the morning, but anybody have uh, one last uh, burning question for me? Uh, I hate speaking in the morning. Okay, so you'll want more coffee for the next speaker, um, who I'd like to introduce now. So Dan Laughlin is joining us from Six Waves Law Labs. Um, do we need a minute for a set change, Neil? So she'll get your, your presentation queued up. So thank you all. Um, so hopefully you found that useful and informative, or at least a little fun.